Just before the message this morning, we have a special trio that's coming. David and Laura and Leah, if they'll get in place, please. what it is 
and how to use it. Uh, it is a sad state for soldiers to go into warfare today having armor and, uh, and armory available to them and yet not know how to access it or to use it. What a dangerous situation that would be. And spiritually, it is the same way. If we do not know how to use or what the armor is and how to use it in our life, uh, we will never have the victory that God wants us to experience. Here in Ephesians 6, verse 17, it says, And take the helmet of salvation, we looked at that last week, and take, is implied there, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I want us to look today at two primary things and questions, and that is, what is it and how do I use it? Father, I pray that you would allow us to understand the truth of your Word. I pray that you would help me to be able to share it in a very clear and uh, uh, precise way. Help us not to be distracted by anything that's around us. I pray that you would bind Satan and his, and his demons, that they would not be able to distract us, that we would listen very carefully to your truth, and that we would understand what it means and be able to implement this in our life on a day-to-day -day basis. I pray all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So what is the sword of the Spirit? Well, in the Roman sword, if you'll think about what they had, there were two types of swords that were available. One was a broad sword that was called. It, was, it could be up to 40 inches long. It was one that you uh, yielded with both of your uh, hands uh, attached to it as you would fight. And that's not the type of sword that's being spoken of here. But this is more of a dagger type sword. It was about 18 inches long. It was sharp on both edges. It had a needle point uh, uh, on it uh, for doing hand-to-hand -hand combat up close. And that's the type of sword that is speaking of here as an illustration of the sword of the spirit. Um, this small sword, sword used for hand-in-hand -hand combat. There's three things that I want you to understand in understanding this particular sword. First of all, it's translation. It is the sword of the spirit, the Bible tells us. Well, that indicates two things. It indicates the kind of sword that it is. Uh, it is the sword of the spirit. It is a spiritual sword because we're in a spiritual battle. <laughs> It's important for us to understand that, but it's also a specific kind of sword. It's a sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Over in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The sword of the Spirit being illustrated here of the Word of God, and we see it time and time again. Matter of fact, uh, uh, about seven times in Scripture, we're told that the Word of God is a sword that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the illustration of that is at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Battle of Armageddon that takes place. And when uh, the Lord defeats uh, that army and uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. It says in verse 19, the remnant, the remnant uh, were slain, the ones that were left over were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, that's the Lord Jesus, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. In other words, there's a sword that will proceed out of his mouth. I don't think it's going to be a literal sword that's you know, seen coming out of his mouth. But that sword is the word of God. In other words, it's his spoken word that will slay him. He is the creator of all things, according to uh, Colossians. All things were created by him and for him, uh, the Lord Jesus, God of the Son. And so when we read in Genesis chapter 1 that God spoke and said, let there be light. And he created all the different uh, days of, of creation and the things that he created that was the Lord Jesus speaking, and his word brought life and brought uh, everything into existence. Well, it is his word that will speak, and he would just say, be slaughtered, and they will die. And so it is that sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, that is God's word spoken to us, those specific words that he brings. 
So it is uh, the kind of sword. It is a spiritual sword. It is the word of God. It also tells us the source of this sword. It is originated with the Holy Spirit of God. It is the sword of the Spirit, capital letter. He is the one that uh, provides it. He is the one that gives us God's word. As a matter of fact, uh, in the New Testament, we, we read how that the Old Testament came about. Uh, in 2 Peter 1, 21, it says, For the prophecy came not uh, in old time by the will of men. In other words, the prophecy is talking about the Old Testament scriptures. It did not come about in, in that past time when, the, when men sat down to write and it was the word of God. Jeremiah didn't just say, hey, I think I'm going to sit down and write a book and it's going to become part of God's inspired word. That's not the way it came about. But it says there that uh, uh, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit. And so... These men, whether it's Moses, or whether it's, whether it's uh, David or Solomon or uh, the prophets, as they wrote, God moved, God carried them along, if you will, and directed them to write exactly what God wanted. So that we know that the end product of what we have, both Old Testament and then uh, later the New Testament, was all directed by the inspiration of God. God breathed, if you will. God controlled the environment. God controlled what was being right, written so that we have the truth without error in God's uh, contained word. We praise the Lord for that assurance and what God has given us. But it's the source of that was the Holy Spirit of God uh, with the word of God. So understand it's the spirit sword it's not my sword. It's not your sword. Uh, that indicates something to us. If we try to find things in this world in a man-made way, we're going to fail. This is a spiritual battle that we're fighting. So we can't take our carnal means and abilities and try to have victory. For instance, uh, personal abilities. Your and my personal abilities will not necessarily help us to have victory. If the devil is bringing temptation into my life or yours, if he is bringing in hardship or trial, our ability to go through that does not lie upon what we can roll up our sleeve and discipline ourselves and, and muster up the strength and whatever just to, to go on and march through. It is a spiritual battle. And if all I am resting upon is my physical abilities, I'm going to fail. And so I must rely upon the spirit and the spiritual abilities that God gives. As I said before not long ago, it's not by might nor by our power, but it's by God's spirit. And that's where we must uh, access the power for uh, the spiritual battles that we're in. Also, there's personal opinions. Have you ever caught yourself in a conversation, maybe with a coworker or a student at school, a, a co-student, uh, a family member, uh, someone that you're stalking about spiritual things, and uh, you start to say, well, I think that, and you tell them what you think about the subject. Let me inform you, remind you, that what I think and what you think about spiritual truth does not matter. Okay? I am not the authority on the matter. God is the authority, and he has recorded that word right here in his, in his Bible. And so my opinion about those things is not going to uh, uh, make an argument or answer a question for someone else, because, as you know, opinions are like noses. Everyone has one. So we all have opinions, and who's to say that your opinion is any more correct than my opinion? Well, the answer is God. It's His world. We are His people. He created everyone. Whether a person has acknowledged that or not in their life, it doesn't matter. They still belong to God. It is God's way. It is God's word that reveals that way. And so if we are to have a conversation with someone else about spiritual truth, 
and discussion about what is true, then we need to bring into the battle God's Word, the sword of the Spirit. That's where the authority lies. That's where we must understand. So it's not man-made uh, uh, abilities or reasoning or opinions, but it is God's Word. It is the source through the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Not only do we see that it's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, but we see its teacher in our lives. Let me explain something of what we read in 1 Corinthians 2.14. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. God tells us through his word that the natural man, and who is the natural man? Well, it's the man that is in the natural state that he was born in. You know that we're all born as lost sinners? We're all born headed toward hell. We're all born without a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The only time that we can change that is when we come to the realization of where we are and what we are. And we make a choice to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. And the moment we make that choice, that conscious choice, salvation takes place in our life. We're made to be a child of God. And God makes us then different. We are his child. We're no longer the natural man. We have been changed as a child of God, as a new creature in Christ Jesus. So he's talking about the natural man or the lost person, the person that, that still is under the penalty of their sin, headed toward hell. That person, they say, well, you know, I read the Bible, I try to and stuff, but I tell you, I just don't understand anything about it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Now, if you're here today and you claim to be a Christian, but that's your testimony, that makes me nervous. Because you're saying on one hand that you trust in Jesus Christ as the Savior, and you're saying on the other hand, God's not helping me at all to understand his truth, and he promised that he would. Because God has promised us that he would give what I call our resident truth teacher. We're told in uh, John chapter 14 and verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will, Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Verse 17 of John 14 tells us that the Holy Spirit was going to come and abide within us, reside within us. And so he, if he's going to reside within us and bring all truth to our understanding, he is our residing, he is our resident truth teacher. And so every person from the day of Pentecost forward when they trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, immediately the Holy Spirit of God was placed within them. We were baptized with the Holy Spirit of God. Baptized just means to be immersed. When we water baptize, we immerse people in the water. When we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, both things take place. One, I am immersed into the body of Jesus Christ. I am part of God's, as God's child in that relationship. And the Holy Spirit is immersed in me. He comes and dwells within my heart to the point that Paul wrote and God directed him to that anyone that does not have the Spirit of God dwelling within him is none of God's. We don't belong to him. And so every believer has the Holy Spirit residing within. And the Holy Spirit is the comforter who is the resident truth teacher and so when we read the Word of God, we have the Holy Spirit of God that can help us understand that truth and apply it in our lives. So a person that says to me, I read it, I read it, I just don't understand anything. I'm here and they say, I'm a Christian, but I'm hearing my testimony that may indicate that the Holy Spirit of God is not in me. And so that's a scary thing to me. Make sure that you know the Lord Jesus Christ and your Savior. But God has given and made that provision for our need that once we're saved, we have that resident truth teacher that abides within us. And then thirdly, I want you to see not only the translation of it, it's a sword of the spirit, 
uh, and it's a teacher, but I want you to see its effectiveness. The sword of the Spirit is only effective, duh, when you use it. All right? Now let me explain something. Just owning a Bible or toting it under your arm does not help you in the spiritual battle. A soldier that goes into battle with his sword in his sheath and he faces the enemy and he never draws the sword to use it, how can he expect to defend himself? And if we only have the Bible but we don't use it, we're just like that soldier who never pulls his weapon of the sword of the Spirit. And we're neglecting to defend ourselves. But as I said at the beginning, if you don't know what the armor is, how can you possibly use it? It's important for us to know that and to know how to use that weaponry. There's a story I came across that a pastor asked a class of Sunday school children. Here's a question. Who broke down the wall of Jericho? Now let me stop. I'm not going to do a test in here this morning. <laughs> but I hope that you get this because you understand the truth. When the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt going into the promised land, when they finally got there, Joshua was leading them at that point to go across Jordan into the promised land. The first big city they came to was Jericho. And Jericho was a walled city, uh, had protection. There's no way the children of Israel could breach that. But God gave them instructions about circling and so forth. And then God brought down the wall of Jericho so that Israel could go in and fight against and have victory uh, in that battle. So who brought down the wall of Jericho? All right, listen to the story. The pastor asked these uh, children in the Sunday school class, who broke down the wall of Jericho? A boy answered and said, not me, sir. <laughs> the pastor was noticeably upset and turned to the Sunday school teacher and said, is this typical to the, people, to the kids in your class to answer like that? She replied to the pastor, the boy is a trusted and honest child. I really don't think that he did it. <laughs> Sunday school teaching from the days of the Do not get this. I want to talk to you. <laughs> Such a response sent the pastor straight to the Sunday school superintendent. After hearing the pastor's grievance, the superintendent uh, uh, consoled him, saying, I've known the boy and his Sunday school teacher for a number of years, and I just can't picture either one of them doing such a terrible thing. <laughs> In this belief, the pastor sought out the chairman of the deacons. A uh, wise deacon uh, tried to soothe the, the waters with some of his conventional wisdom. Pastor, let's not make a big issue of this. Let's just pay for the damages and charge it to the maintenance account. <laughs> <laughs> In the same article, uh, it says that the Library of Congress conducted a survey which asked, it says, which book has most influenced your life? You know what the number one answer was? The Bible. And the same survey went on. It said there, um, Yet during the typical week, only 45% of American Christians read the Bible any time between Sunday to the next Sunday. And that's just the ones that admit it. 45% say they read the Bible uh, during the week. Of the 45%, just 12% claimed to read God's Word daily. Just 12%. That means that 55% don't even bother to open the Bible once during the week. If that is true of us as Christians, maybe that story I just told you could be true. 
If we do not get into God's word any more than that, we have no knowledge of God and his word. We are relying on status quo from whatever we learn at whatever time in our life. But we're not having any kind of relationship with God and walk with him now. It's important if we're going to have victory to know what our armor is and know how to draw the sword and use it. We've got to get into the word of God. All Christians have the Bible. All Christians have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within them. But do you know how to use that word? Jesus said in John 13, 17, he said, if you know these things, happy or blessed are you if you do them. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Just knowing them is not enough. We've got to actually put it into practice. Paul wrote in Acts chapter 20, verse 27, he says, For I have not shunned, the word shunned there means that I have not ignored my responsibility, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Why did the Apostle Paul take those believers that had gotten saved, that he was trying to get established into the work and, and develop pastors over them, etc.? Why did he make such a big effort to try to teach them all of God's word? And the answer is obviously because he wanted them to know it and to use it. I want the same thing for you as believers in this church. I want you to not only know what the Word of God says, but I want you to know how to walk out of here and use that this next week. And that takes putting into place and using the armor that God has given it, given to us. That's why we have preaching such as this. That's why we have, and we'll get back to you, Sunday school and youth ministry and adult Bible study because those things are in place to equip you. But you've got to take the advantage, you've got to, to make the effort to expose yourself to that teaching in order to benefit. State police has an academy down here. They have uh, also uh, in training with uh, firearms and other other um, uh, subject matter they have to go through to keep uh, abreast and, and, and ready. In their situation, they don't just make it available, but they say, get out of here and use it. <laughs> Well, let's say that the state police only said, hey, you know, firearms uh, training and, uh, and certification and update. Uh, you know, if you've got time, you know, come on down. If nothing else is going on, you know, you, you're kind of bored, come on down and, and uh, get, you know, checked out. And Would everybody do it? Would people suffer from it? If we look at God's church, Sunday school, and Bible study, youth ministry, if, well, you know, if there's nothing else going on, and you know, and, and, uh, you know, if we got time, we'll try to make it there. What's it going to be? Where is the discipline? Where do you think? How do you view God in your life? Is He important to you? Is that relationship in her? Mahatma Gandhi, he spoke forcefully to Christians when he said, you Christians have in your keeping a document with enough dynamite in it to blow the whole of civilization to bits, to turn society upside down, to bring peace to this war-torn world. But you read it as if it was some good literature and nothing else. As I've said before, and we need to be careful of this, some of us, I'm afraid, spend more time 
reading in social media, media than we do in God's Word. Why do we do that? Because we're testifying. Social media is more important to me than God's Word and knowing it. That's what we were saying. And we don't think about it. We just let it happen. What is the sword of the Spirit? Secondly, how do we use that sword? Well, it's two ways primarily. Number one, primarily, is defensive. Some people argue and say the sword of the Spirit is where we go when we attack Satan. Well, I'll show you how it's used offensively in just a minute. But you know the context of Ephesians chapter 6 of what it's talking about? It's talking about withstanding the devil's attacks. It's not talking about charging the devil. The scripture says resist the devil and he will flee from you. So primarily the sword of the spirit is defensive in its nature. Now there are three words for the word of God. Three Greek words that are found in the New Testament. The first one is the graphe. Graphe means or refers to the writings of God. The scriptures of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All graphe is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that's the teachings, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And we have the word of God, all of it, from cover to cover, has been given to us by the inspiration, the control of God through the Holy Spirit. It's reliable, it's profitable for our teaching is profitable for reproof to confront us when we're wrong. It's profitable for correction to tell us how when we're wrong to get right. And it's profitable for instruction in righteousness telling us how to stay right once we've got the right with God. That's the writings. You have it in your hand from cover to cover. There's a second word. It's the logos. The Logos refers to the message of God. We get the word from Logos, we get the word Logo. Logos like Nike, Coca-Cola, Starbucks, uh, Ford, um, um, Facebook, they have trademarks or their, their logo that is recognizable. <clears throat> when you see it, you know exactly what you're getting, okay? Well, that's what the Logos is. It's the message of the word. When you see the Logos, you, get, you know exactly what you're getting. Now, Jesus primarily is the Logos. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, the Logos. And the word was with God, and the word was God. We know that to be God the Son because in verse 14 it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's Bethlehem. That's Christmas. That's when Jesus Christ, God the Son, the Word, the Logos, took on human flesh to be born as a child. In verse 18, it says that no man has seen God at any time, but the Son of God, the Logos, the Word, hath declared Him, hath revealed Him. When we see the Lord God, we see the message, the revealing of the truth of God. When you, you talk about the scriptures, Jesus said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, for they are they that testify of me. That was the Old Testament. We know the New Testament testifies of the Lord Jesus Christ. But even the Old Testament told about the Lord Jesus Christ in so many ways. And in the New Testament, we're told that when you see the Lord Jesus Christ and you get to, to concentrate on the glory of the Lord, we know what God is like. Because Jesus is God. Amen? We know that the Word, the Logos, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. We know the truth. And so when we see Jesus, we see the message. When we see the scripture that reveals what Jesus is like in scripture, 
we see the Logos and we see the message of the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, what we wrote, it says, read, it says, For the Word of God, for the Logos of God is quick as alive and is powerful, is sharper than any two short, it's piercing, even dividing asunder of soul and spirit. That's spiritual. And of the joints and marrow. That's physical. You know that the Word of God is involved with us spiritual and it has ramifications in our physical life. That's just obvious. When God deals with us spiritual, spiritually, it has ramifications in our physical life and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The thoughts and intents, my very motives, my attitudes, etc. Some of the things that I'm not even aware of why I do them, God says that His Word can show me even that truth. It can reveal to me those specifics. Have you ever had a broken bone? Or suspected? You go to the doctor, you can't look at your collarbone. You can't look at your, your wrist or your ankle or foot and see the bone broken. But they do what? They, they x-ray it. Because it shows what it's like on the inside. That's what the Word of God does. It reveals to us what's on the inside. Verse 13, I had Daryl read this this morning. Thank you, Daryl. And verse 13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Now we're on line his. It's talking about in verse 12, the written Word of God. When you get to verse 13, it's talking about the living Word of God. And both are the same logos. Both of the message that God has for us. And it says, neither is there any creature that is, manifest, uh, is not manifest in sight, but all things are naked and open, revealed unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do, who we must give an account of, is what it means. God sees everything. He sees my heart. He sees the intent of my heart. He sees the reasons why behind what I do. And God can show me those reasons in my life through His Word, the message of the Word of God, the Logos. But there's also a third word, graphe, the writings, the scriptures, Logos, the message. Then there's the word, Greek word, Rima, Rima. It refers to the spoken word, specifically to the specific sayings of God in his word. Uh, when God says uh, for us over here in Ephesians chapter 6 that we're to take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, it is the rima of God that he's talking about. So we have here that truth of what uh, the word of God is. It's the rima that he's talking about. It's the rima of God that's part of the, is the sword of the spirit that we're to use in defense uh, uh, when we are being attacked by Satan and his demons. And so we need to understand a little bit about this. And, and let me say this first. Please understand this. There are some Christians that are stuck in graphe. They're stuck bringing their Bible to church and taking it back home and putting it on the dresser or, or nightstand or somewhere. But that's all that they do. They're stuck in graphe land. There's some Christians that are stuck in Logos land. They, they come and they take notes and they are in Bible study they hardly ever miss and they're learning all that they can learn but they don't use it in their life. They're just stuck in Logos land. You know, taking notes of the messages and the Bible studies does you no good whatsoever if you don't use it. I had to deal with that in my life years ago. I'd go to seminars and I would sit there and I would write and take notes. I even sometimes took me a little digital recorder and, and if he was talking too fast that I could go back and, and fill out my notes and get everything and come home and later I'd find my notes and i think, I ain't done a thing with them. And it convicted my heart. God convicted my heart. He said, what good? Is to go. Now I know that I learned some things just by listening. 
There are different kinds of, of learning. Some of you, if you had to take notes, you'd be too distracted to try to take the notes, you wouldn't get anything. There are other people that if they don't take notes, they don't get anything. They're different kind of learners. But I had to come to grips with this, that if I'm going to take notes, I need to go back and read over those notes and rehearse those notes and implement those notes, that truth in my life. That's the only way it's going to benefit. Don't get stuck in Logos land, but Rima is the truth of God's word that deals with our specific situation. Jesus is the example of this. I told you this before. Some of you have not heard from me before, but I'm going to share this with you very quickly. In Matthew chapter 4, after Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, it says that the devil came unto him and tempted him. And there were three primary areas of temptation that the devil came with. The first one had to do with the obvious. Jesus was tired. He was hungry. He hadn't had anything for 40 days and 40 nights. I can't imagine. And the devil says, if you're the son of God, just go ahead and make these rocks into bread and satisfy yourself. What did Jesus do? He said, it is written. Man shall not live. He quoted this in the Old Testament scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Every rima that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Every specific, specific saying, as we'll see in a moment. He tempted him, number two, with popularity, you could call it. Took him up to the, uh, the pinnacle of the temple, the highest part of the temple. And he said, the scriptures say that, that uh, if, if you cast yourself down, that the angels will bury you up. You won't even bruise your heel. People will say, man, a miracle, this is great. Why don't you do that? Again, Jesus responded, it is written and quoted in scripture. The third temptation. He took him up to a, a great high mount, mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, you don't have to go to the cross. All these people represented by these countries, I'll give them to you. Just fall down and worship me. What did Jesus do? It is written. You should not worship other gods. You won't worship the God. Every time that Jesus was tempted, whether it was the lust of the flesh or the pride of life or the lust of the eyes, every time in those categories that he was tempted, he quoted scripture, but not just any scripture. He didn't say John 3.16. He didn't quote Jesus wept. Shortest script, verse in the scripture. He didn't just quote any scripture, but he quoted scripture that dealt with the specific temptation that he was experiencing. What are the temptations that you are so often dealing with in your life? You know what they are. Let me tell you that the devil, his demons, they know exactly what they are. Every man, when he's tempted, is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, bait to hook. The devil and his demons are great fishers. They know exactly what bait to put in front of your flesh to get you to fight for that temptation. And if you have no sword in your sheath that you can pull, you're doomed to repeat the sin. So how do we pull the sword? Well, we find the specific verses of Scripture that deal with the temptations that we know that we're going to face <clears throat> that he keeps bringing before us. And we memorize those scriptures. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. The rima, the specifics of my temptation have I hid in my heart so that when the devil and his demons brings that temptation to my face, then I 
can pull that sword, or better yet, the Holy Spirit of God can pull that sword of His and bring to my mind those verses and remind me to think about what I'm fixing to do. Because so often we go ahead and sin and then we think to ourselves, what was I thinking? Why did I do that again? And the answer is, I wasn't thinking. Because I didn't put any verses in the sheep for the Holy Spirit of God to bring to my mind. And I was unequipped with the sword of the Spirit. God has made it available. We know what it is. Are we going to use it? Primarily defensive. Using the sword, the rima, to fight the specific temptations. And then the last, very quickly, secondarily, it's offensive. It can be offensive. Proclaiming the Word of God. Preaching is proclaiming the Word of God right now. It's using the sword specifically to help you, equip you. You can use the rima in your life to specifically help someone else. Maybe a co-worker or a friend. <clears throat> it, may be, it may be your Sunday school class or, or youth ministry club that you're teaching. It may be your own children in your home that you're trying to teach. But anyone that we're taking the Word of God and we're trying to help them and equip them to better be able to stand against the wiles of the devil in their life, that's using the sword in an offensive way. We're to do that. Witnessing is using the word of God in an offensive way. Witnessing is not preaching to somebody else. What does a witness do? They tell about what they have seen or experienced. So when you witness, you go to someone and say, Hey, would you mind if I share with you how I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior? Now, you know how you came to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you don't, we need to make sure that you are. How did you get here today? Now, I know some of you are a little directionally challenged. But you ought to be able to give directions to how to get to the church. And witnessing is just giving directions of how to get to Jesus Christ. As your Savior. And he says that we're to do so not just with our opinion about it, but we're to tell them what God's Word says. Because the Word of God is the power of God unto salvation. Faith comes by hearing specifically the Word of God. God honors His Word, not our clever arguments. And so we are to witness. That's offensively using the Word of God by helping those that are enslaved into the relationship with the devil, you may say, because they're still lost. When we help free them by giving them the truth of the gospel, we're using it in an offensive way. When we're impacting and influencing other Christians, helping equip them to stand, we're using it in an offensive way. Heads bow, please. I just want to talk to you as our music musicians come to play softly. I don't want you to look around. I just want you to think about yourself. I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand right now. I want you to be honest with yourself where you are. What I'm going to tell you right now, if you'll follow it, will help you. Don't be satisfied with status quo in your spiritual life. Don't be satisfied with status quo. Not one of us in here today can say, I don't have any need for improvement in my walk with the Lord. Every one of us can use improvement. 
so that we ought to con continually seek to improve and using the armor that God has provided us we're to seek to improve especially when it comes to using our sword the rhema, the Holy Spirit sword of the word of God the specific saying so that we can stand and withstand the devil's temptations in our life and have victory We especially need to improve, improve in those areas. Christian, where are you today? I'm not talking about in this building. Where are you today in this message? Are you stuck in Rafa land, just carrying your Bible to church and taking it home? Are you stuck in Logos land and learning the Word of God but not really using it in your life the way that you should? Do you need to ask God to help you to better use your sword? Helping others use theirs and defending against the devil's attack for his demons. Where are you today in this message? What is the decision that God wants you to make before you leave today? Will you make that right now with Him? If you will do that, you have benefited from the message of being in church this morning. But if you walk out of here no different, all you did was sit and occupy a chair. What's it going to be in your life today? Are you serious about making a difference? Father, I pray that each one of us would be serious when it comes to our walk with you and that we would seek to be able to be used of you in using your word in our life both to follow personally as well as to help others. I pray that you would not only help us to use it, but Lord, make us an example to others to follow. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for being here with us today. I do want to uh, encourage you uh, to continue.